Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, Blink Innovation. Welcome to uh, Lincoln University. Um, hope everybody is comfortable here in the room. Um, hope everybody enjoyed the cup of coffee and the fresh muffins. I'm sorry for the people zooming in and live streaming that we could not provide you with the muffins, but hopefully next time you'll be here in the room. Um, my name is Wim de Koning. Um, I am a, a one of the team members of Blink Innovation, and together with my colleague uh, Katie and Julia, will be taking care of you today. Um, we're going to talk about the future of fiber. And then, for those of you who looked at the program carefully, you basically recognize that we're only going to talk about two fibers today. And of course, we recognize that there are many more fibers here in New Zealand, from the traditional fibers that uh, uh, that we, that everybody used before we introduced uh, uh, livestock and sheep, um, but also into uh, a lot of other fibers that we're actually using in the form of uh, uh, wool from sheep. Today is very much about looking at new fibers and looking at fibers and seeing how they could fit into the future of New Zealand when it comes to fibers. So we'll be looking at hemp today, and we'll be looking at uh, angora goats and mohair today, th this morning. So, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of health and safety. And I would assume that everybody sitting at home, you know where your nearest exit is. For the people here in the room, um, we'll have a, a number of exits. There is an exit behind you, the door that you came in. There is an exit out here. We do not expect any fire drills today. So in other words, if we have a fire alarm, it is real. And then uh, the very competent Blink team will lead us out to a grassy area in front of the building, and they will keep us safe. If we would have an earthquake, well, you already know what to do, right? We're going to find a table, and we're going to be really comfy with all of us under a couple of tables. <laughs> um, if you need to go to the bathroom, uh, the bathroom is uh, if you uh, walked through to the door that you uh, came into, turn right, and then uh, at the end of the hallway on your right-hand side, that's where the bathrooms are. I think that's everything that I need to tell you in the case of an emergency. Um, virtual housekeeping. So for the people that are actually online at the moment, um, the, the webinar that we're having now will be recorded. It will be available in about 72 hours. If you want to ask questions, use the chat function. Because everybody at home is muted, or in their office, is muted. So you definitely need to use your, your chat function to ask questions. And we will actually, Katie and, uh, and uh, Julia in the back of the room, they will actually help me to moderate those, uh, those questions if they, if they come to the end of the session and we will have a Q&A. Like I said, all participants are muted. Um, well, you're in the house of Blink Innovation. Blink Innovation is um, a business unit of Lincoln University, and basically what we do is we do three things. We like to think of uh, uh, our job is to connect people. And this is very much one of these events that we're doing, where we basically make sure that there is a little bit of time to socialize before we get into, we get into the topic, and also afterwards there will be a time to actually, to actually connect to people. We really believe that in that connecting to people and talking to people, you will start to discover that other people might be able to add to your idea or your business model or your farming system, and hopefully you'll start to collaborate. And if you actually start to collaborate and actually start working together, we truly believe that the real innovation will take place. So hence the fact that we at Blink Innovation, we focus on connecting people and, and hoping that it will become collaboration, which we facilitate, and then, you know, and then we'll do, um, uh, hopefully, innovation will actually start. 
Blink Innovation, we also have a uh, co-working space. So if you are um, uh, a young startup and you want to um, uh, benefit from this, uh, this, this inspiring environment, you are very welcome to join us. Topic of today, future of fiber. And I, like I already said, we are looking at two, um, I wanted to say novel fibers, but of course that's not, because they, are, they, are, they are, have been around for a long, long, long time. But they're not in the mainstream, and so that's why we wanted to talk t about them today. We have a lineup of wonderful speakers today, but before I'm going to introduce the speakers, please make sure that um, if you like us, you actually connect to us on um, uh, social media. You're very welcome to do so. Our speakers, we have um, four speakers today. Um, we have uh, Dr. Pamjit. He is actually one of uh, um, uh, the innovative companies that are actually based in our uh, co-working space. Um, specialist in hemp. And uh, so he will talk us through the uh, potential future of hemp and hemp fiber here in New Zealand. Then we're moving towards goats and uh, angora goats and uh, the production of mohair, but also what is involved by actually keeping, keeping those animals. And so we have um, uh, David taking the perspective, looking at it from a farmer's point of view. We have John looking at it from the global, okay, where are we with mohair uh, point of view and, and, and where is the trade and where is the value? And then we are very fortunate to have Vicky here that will give us a little bit of an idea, okay, what is involved um, when it comes to nutrition and uh, husbandry situations. So without further ado, I would like to uh, ask uh, uh, Dr. Pamjit to start talking about hemp. Thanks, Wim, and uh, thanks for the introduction. So yeah, my topic is, so yeah, as Wim has just already stated that uh, this crop is here from a long time, from civilization, hemp is there, but uh, it's a, a resurgence of this crop or a rene renewal of this crop. and. Uh, uh, currently, I will be only simply focusing on the fiber side of this crop. And uh, fiber in New Zealand has been traditionally dominated by wool. And, but uh, currently, the wool is uh, being uh, challenged by this synthetic fibers, and export demand is not going up. So certainly, there are ways, like with synthetic, anything synthetic, we have issues with from sustainability point of view, as everybody know about it. So that's where I'm trying to talk about uh, uh, this hemp. Does it uh, come in that space uh, with the latest technological developments happening on the uh, getting the fiber from this crop? Although this crop is for food, fiber, and health, uh, with some uh, regulatory, uh, 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 you can say some regulations around it. What can be done from this crop and what can't we? So it's a, it's a old crop, like Chinese are sowing it from three to 4,000 years back. And uh, in Europe, it's quite advanced, like France is quite advanced in terms of fiber for this crop. Uh, I will just try to introduce this plant. So this is a monoecious plant. When I say that, that the male and female flowers are on, on two, two different plants. So this is a female plant. And in the back, this is a male plant. So pollination happens on this and then the seed forms on the top and fluorescence up to here and rest of the plant is fiber. But uh, when we say fiber, so there is a lot of different kind of fiber in, in this one. So why this crop has, is being revived? So one thing is uh, around the sustainability or the climate change. We are, we have, a, New Zealand is really up to, up to this uh, current challenge in terms of uh, carbon sequestration and other things we need in crops. So if you see, uh, this hemp fiber uh, can produce, uh, hemp can produce fiber double than cotton in the same square meter area if we compare, and it's four times from the trees. 
and at the same time, it's sequestering about uh, 20 tons of CO2, carbon dioxide, in its growth cycle, and it's, it's quite fast, like within 140 days for a seed crop. And uh, basically for fiber, there are two kinds of crops. One are very specific for fiber. They, you, then you, you, do, you don't get a seed, so they go, go quite long from three to five meter. And on the other side, you harvest seed, and then there's a fiber in that. So this is uh, another thing about this crop, good thing is, it's also used for phytoremediation. When I say phytoremediation, a lot of heavy metals from soil are picked up by this crop. And uh, latest re research happening in Europe shows that all those heavy metals are kept in the rooting side of things. It means still we can use the seed uh, for food. And a uh, lot of cultivars are now, or the germplasm is being scanned. And in the last 100 years, nothing much happened around this plant. Reason is that it's the same species as cannabis. And there's a sigma, stigma attached around cannabis. And once the cannabis was banned, so this also went down 100 years back. So a lot of uh, basic research is still happening now on this crop. And uh, so uh, again, going towards the fiber, so there's a food on the top, fiber in the, on that. And uh, in the fiber, there are two kind of fibers. One is very uh, niche type of fiber, uh, which we call bast fiber. It's, if you see outside, uh, this one is the bast fiber. Then next one is the bit smaller kind of fiber, which is the woody one, and uh, we call it uh, herd. And the middle of this, this is a uh, transfer section of this, uh, this stem. So then the middle of this uh, stem is hollow. And when I'm, I'm writing, uh, saying these things, I will give an overview of uh, what's the modern, today's world with technological developments, what are the modern hemp applications. So this is a hemp crop, and you can see there are stalks and the seed on that. And the seed is currently hulled or cold pressed. They cold press it, and the hemp seed oil is currently used for uh, various, uh, it's, it's a superfood, Another way, the hemp seed is a superfood, but once you have that uh, seed extracted out of it, we have those high value products like seed cake, and you might be looking in our supermarkets, a lot of hemp protein is there. So, uh, and the, it's a very healthy balance of those fatty acids, uh, omega-3 uh, fatty acids, which are, which are good for the humans. So basically, it's, 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 that's why currently seed is driving the crop, rather than the, on the fiber side. But on the fiber, so once, for example, in a dual purpose crop, we take off the seeds and with the second combined harvesting, we get the stalks. And stalks, as I already talked, the, the, the good quality fiber is long, bast fiber. And uh, with the textile is the most uh, revenue generating part of this long bast, but it can be used for quality papers. And uh, there's a lot of composites like in car industry, uh, in, even in the last century, Ford used it to make its uh, car, uh, different automotive parts from it. So it can go there. And the short bast, which is the inside woody co core, the most important thing is the construct construction materials which can be made from it. And currently, uh, University of Melbourne and Ariel University in Israel, they are already created a hempcrete which are uh, currently replacing this, uh, our uh, traditional uh, construction materials. And uh, th this thing is also happening in New Zealand. There are a few companies here. They are trying to make your own home by grow or grow your own home in a way. So this whole plant can be used. Here when I say the, ne sorry, the next thing, these even leaves can be used. Some of the, but before I be careful, when this crop is industrial, hemp crop, under the license, uh, these leaves can't be used, but the leaves around the inflorescence and around the seed has a bracket in which there is a lot, lot of bioactives, which have a medicinal value around that. So the whole plant can be used. There's no waste, this is zero waste from the plant. And I will just uh, give a, uh, now I will focus on only on the fiber side of things. So if it's the crop is in the field, then as we see for other crops like wheat uh, or the other crops, the agronomy is sort of similar to wheat in terms of fertilization and other things. But definitely when we compare with cotton, 
uh, New Zealand has the opportunity like cotton grows in a subtropical environment and uh, uh, cotton takes about uh, double the amount of water. The inputs in terms of insecticides, pesticides is enormous and uh, new insect pests on cotton are creating a lot of problems and fiber has a lot of pesticides coming in that. So this is the opportunity where hemp can be grown in New Zealand and uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with this thing, the straw comes out from, uh, from this crop, unlike uh, when we pluck the flower from the cotton crop. And this straw is either currently harvested uh, through a combined harvest which formed into stalks, and this is the herd, which is the internal core, woody part, which is separated. And uh, when we do this, there is a, another, which is the niche part, which goes into textile industry, is the, that bast fiber, the long fiber. So what happened, like uh, until now, there was not much technology to separate this uh, niche fiber from this herd, where both are the good resources to be used, uh, herd in the building industry, and uh, this uh, bast fiber to, the, uh, to our textile industry or other high-end uses. So earlier, a process was used, ratting, they call it ratting. In ratting, basically, it's a very time-consuming process and it's very expensive, like you have to remove this fiber by either by steam or putting this crop after harvesting in water so the outside fiber is removed. That was a big technological problem. So now currently in last few years, th there's another process known as decortification. So decortification is an engineering machine in which you uh, put these sticks through it and your uh, bast fiber and your herd is separated and uh, it's quite uh, cheaper, and these machines are stationary. Now they are also making it movable. The idea is so that it can go to the farmer's field there, and uh, this uh, fi bast fiber for textile can move to, for example, if there's a textile factory, it can move in the country at one place, and the herd fiber can stay there around in 50 kilometer area to make hempcrete and use it in the building industry. So that's one way of doing it. So currently, like this from uh, this textile site, this felts are made, and even uh, uh, in a normal textile process, no machinery change is required, like for those cotton, uh, 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 cotton spindles. Uh, once this thing is uh, separated, uh, this uh, uh, bast fiber can be spent in the way we do cotton. So that's, that's a quite a good, there's no technological gap in a way to go to that side. But still, like this, uh, there are few challenges or gaps to go up to that. As this crop is, farmers are growing here. I'll go on the next slide to share those things. So currently I will just go on, on the market side. Now the data is not very clear on this because in the same crop, uh, you are getting the seed, you are getting the fiber out of it. And fiber data is not very clear on this side. And even in North America, they are also extracting the bioactive slice CBD from it. So, but if you see, the China is a traditional leader in this in terms of the products there. And uh, US is uh, like 30%. And in Europe, it's uh, Fr France, which is mainly uh, doing a lot of uh, advancement, especially on the fiber side of this crop. And uh, you can say it's this thing overlays in terms of who are the leaders on, on the hemp side of things. And uh, so yeah, th this is a big opportunity in a way uh, with few gaps uh, which if we fill, uh, New Zealand has a lot of chance to go further on this thing. So I just uh, try to see, I was looking at the data in New Zealand that what's the, what, what are the, what are the uh, uh, challenges or pitfalls? So until now, uh, we could not recognize this opportunity. Although with this decortification is the main thing where where things become faster in a way to separate this fiber. So there's an industrial hemp report by Charles and Merfield, which is 1999. It was a leadership course where in this industrial hemp, he, he, he wrote a very good report in terms of agronomy and other things that what's, what are the challenges. But in the end, he said the fiber is of poor quality in this report because the reason was that when you are doing ratting, the removal of that uh, uh, bast fiber from herd was a problem, and he was pretty much uh, on on dot that oh, this is this should people should grow it, but it can't be a main thing because the fiber is of poor quality, and uh, this uh, 20 years has shown us another report. This came in the end of 2020, 
So this is uh, done by New Zealand Industrial Hemp Association. So here currently with this advance is they are putting this industry with food and fiber. This industry within next 10 years is predicted to be $500 million industry. So currently food or the seed side is driving it. And uh, currently 19 uh, uh, cultivars are recommended by MOH because it's regulated by Ministry of Health. 19 those cultivars can be grown in New Zealand. And my team has done six to compare them because there's no data in terms of in Canterbury that what should be good for food, what should be good for fiber, and what it should be good for both, like a dual purpose cultivar. And currently, like in North America, they are looking at a tri-purpose cultivar. When are they looking at tri-purpose cultivar? At the same time, they are extracting the bioactives or CBD and its derivative from the plant. And with the, that side of the agronomy, Still nobody know how to get those bioactive maximum under field conditions. So these are, these are a few gaps in that. But in this report, so they are expecting that you have $500 million industry, but later on if these regulations around this crop are again uh, revisited, same thing in Australia for those bioactives, then it will be a four times large industry, about $2 billion industry. But definitely it's on paper. There are a lot of things to be done in a way, but that's a good pathway or, or to see especially to read this report that what's on the fiber side of things can happen with this crop, especially with the sustainability and carbon footprint of this crop is zero. So then I was trying to see that uh, what are the challenges to developing this fiber ecosystem uh, parallel to our this uh, sheep wool or uh, another fiber sources here. And with our uh, really good growing uh, agroclimatic zone, this crop can, first of all, can be introduced as a rotational crop in Canterbury. Like in our current uh, that, uh, dairy sheep and cropping systems, this crop might have a long root system. It might pick up the nutrients and recycle them. That's one way. Another thing is the phytoremediation, especially in those uh, dairy paddocks, that might be a good idea. And uh, this, uh, if the seed produce gets some heavy metals, still it can be used as a seed, not as a food crop. So there are those things in the start to start taking baby steps of getting this crop into the crop rotation. So if I see, so any, any industry which is uh, getting raw materials from, uh, from this primary uh, supply system, it should have a reliable supply and a consistent quality. And from my agronomy side, the important constraints are the varieties, as I said. Like those 19, nobody has compared yet in New Zealand, all of them to, together in different uh, agroclimatic zones of New Zealand to see what's the, uh, what production in terms of food fiber we are getting from this crop. So that's on that side where my team is working on that. And another thing, once you found out, then the certified seed is very important to get for this crop. And, uh, accordingly to meet their domestic demand. So, so what we are trying to do in, in Green Lab, so like I'm, I'm also working on the medical cannabis side of things. I don't discriminate bo with both plants. They are the, from the same species, although it grows out and uh, uh, its uh, bioactives are not psychoactive in a way, and you have to meet those requirements. So currently uh, I have done some work in Australia on dual purpose cultivars. And with that dual purpose cultivar, there's one frog one in Australia, which we also trying to bring it here and, and compare with these 19 cultivars. So it gives us about a ton of seed and about uh, eight tons of fiber. And out eight tons of fiber, we have about three tons of this high quality bast fiber. And the uh, uh, six tons is about that uh, wood chip, which can be used as hempcrete. And uh, this is another experiment here we did in Canterbury where we have put those six cultivars to understand their dynamics in terms of uh, fiber and food. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pamjeet. Um, David? Yeah. You have your own microphone, I think. Yeah. So it should work. That's the clicker. There you go.
mind journey, uh, if I can, um, and uh, explain to you this animal and what it means. Um, it's a markor. Uh, a markor is a native of uh, the hills in the, uh, in the uh, Central Asia. Uh, it's Pakistan, the national animal of Pakistan. And um, what's significant about this markor is um, if one looks, or oh, I've got a pointer, um, there and down here, you can see traces of fibre hanging in uh, on, its, on its skin surface there. It's shedding. Um, and this is the ancestral uh, animal of today's uh, angora goat, Capra uh, falconeri, I think it is. Um, a famous animal, very depleted in the wild today. Uh, only small numbers exist, probably less than a couple of thousand in the wild. There are some zoo populations. Um, and over the millennia, um, mankind has taken this wild animal and um, selectively bred from those with more of the down. And then out of those down animals, subsequently um, selected for animals with greater and greater production from the secondary follicles on the skin. You all know about primary and secondary follicles. Um, so. Uh, that's the ancestral animal. Um, I think it's important for us to um, consider it um, because it tells us things that we need to know about what we're farming as an animal today. Um, John Woodward uh, from uh, the marketing division side of things is going to talk more about mohair production and so on. I'm going to try and emphasize um, where we are with the farming of the animal uh, and then he will lead into more the mohair and marketing and production of um, so I think looking at this animal, um, there are a couple of significant things. One is um, that there's quite a large degree of sexual dimorphism. I like talking about sex. Uh, and the fact that the males are quite a bit bigger than the females um, is significant. Um, has implications, and I'll get back to that a little bit later on, but I'd just like to, while we've got this slide up, I'd like you just to remember that I talked about sexual dimorphism. Um, then, uh, we talk about the potential of our industry and um, what that means in terms of farming. Uh, now, market demand is at the moment is, is very high and global production for various reasons, uh, which John will elucidate us on, um, is actually declining. Um, so what we've got is high market demand and low global production. Um, it's a perfect storm. Uh, and it gives us the potential to increase mohair production beyond our dreams. Um, now, that sounds like a bit of um, enthusiastic, um, you know, talk from a, from a long-standing goat farmer. Um, it's just a fact. Uh, we are at the moment sitting in that perfect situation where there's more demand than we've got production, and therefore the price has gone up. Um, well, uh, I think that there are two implications for that of increasing mahi production. One of them is what we can do in terms of growing our industry, more people, and what we can do in terms of growing our industry as individuals. And uh, it may be that growing the industry does not require more mohair in total, but more of a certain type of mohair, um, uh, the more high demand, high end particular segment of it. And that is happening. Um, over the last few years, we've seen large numbers of goats removed from the global population, angora goats, I should say, uh, large numbers of angora goats removed from the world population, but there's been huge selection pressure on the, on the individual type of animal, on the specific type of animal, and mohair goats have changed, angora goats have changed over the last 20 years, more particularly in the last 10, um, to the extent where they're producing a much higher quality fibre across a range of animals than they were previously. Um, John will talk about that as well, about the percentage of mohair that's going into various parts. I'm passing a lot of stuff on to John here. Um, hopefully he's talking about those things. Um, okay, a transition. Um, this old guy here is a, the last of the feral angora goats that was caught in the wild in New Zealand. 
Um, he's deceased now. Um, his name is Magwa, which is the last of the Mohecans, uh, for those of you. <laughs> um, anyway, New Zealand had uh, an Angora goat or mohair industry back in the late 1800s, and um, uh, there were populations of these goats escaped from, from, the, uh, from the original farming and went wild in places. And up near where I live at Waipu, there was a, a patch of bush, uh, several hundred or several thousand hectares, and some survived there and did not cross with other feral goats. So they remained a pure but reverted type. And their production was low. They'd grow about six pounds a year and, uh, of mohair of an indifferent quality. Um, but they made tremendous transition stock and were used as the basis for the development of New Zealand's current mohair industry by Lands and Survey Department um, as their foundation stock. This chap here is, I can't even remember his name or number now, but he's a buck that's pretty typical of what we have available today. And um, these goats um, will produce tremendous amounts of mohair um, in excess of 10% of their body weight per annum. Uh, and I'd like to emphasise that 10% of your body weight per annum is, is a tremendous amount of mohair. Um, and a buck weighing 80 kilos can produce and will produce 8 kilos of mohair, even more. Um, it's, it's, there's no animal in the fibre production um, you know, pantheon that can grow um, more as a percentage of their body weight. Um, the implications of that are is that you can't get blood from a stone. And as Gene Ebling, a famous Texan mohair producer, said, you cannot starve a prophet out of an angora goat. And if you're going to produce uh, eight kilos or more per animal, per annum, you have to feed it accordingly. And so the implications for us are that this old, whoop, sorry, um, this old guy, um, he, didn't, he survived in the bush because he didn't have that drain on his resources and he could eat enough and grow body weight and reproduce and so on. Um, whereas this guy, you put him in the bush, he would actually probably get tangled in some blackberry and die. <laughs> and, and he wouldn't have enough ability to eat enough good food to produce his eight kilos. Having said that, he's genetically programmed to produce eight kilos. So he can't do that without sacrificing something and inevitably it'll come off his body weight and therefore reproductive capacity and so on. So in a farming situation, if we want to go from magwa to this guy, you have to be prepared to feed accordingly. Um, and there are some of us who are stuck in between. I'd say that um, they might look like that, but often they are deprived of sufficient nutrition and end up with poor sized goats and, uh, and low production, uh, both. Okay, moving on. This particular graph is the most important thing that I will show anybody ever in my life if he's interested in ang or she is interested in angora goats. And if you don't understand this, then don't have goats. Uh, honestly, it's very important. Um, this here is a series of graphs which show the way that goats develop and grow. Now, here we have, for instance, body mass. And if you follow that line back, you will see that goats grow, this is years along the bottom, goats don't reach their full body mass until they're four or five years old. This is a fundamental difference between goats and the likes of, say, sheep. Um, and it's fatal for people to fall into the, to, into the, 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 the uh, realisation or the lack of realisation that they've got a goat that's three years old and it's anywhere near its optimum body size. It isn't. Um, and I think this is one of the things that people have to understand um, about the farming of them. Mohair mass, for instance, peaks here at year three or four and then falls away relatively steadily. Staple length is higher as young animals and then slowly declines. Um, some of us might have observed a steeper decline than that. Um, these are based on Texas, Texan goats. Um, Morris Shelton uh, from Texas A&M University did this work back in the 1960s. Things have changed a little bit genetically perhaps. Um, fibre diameter strengthens as you can see there and um, uh, kilos of mohair per kilo of body mass um, declines. That's largely because of the increase in body mass 
and also from about here that things, that they, the mohair um, starts to fine up a bit as well. The critical thing I mentioned, why I'm saying this is important, is that there's a sweet spot in here that you make your money. Um, up till the age of about three, typically, sometimes four. Individuals vary, of course, on, on this. Um, but the important mm -hmm. thing here is that you understand that this is where you make the money. Young animals growing fine, long mohair. Why, I ask, would you want to put a reproductive capability in there just at the time that the animal's making its most money? And so I'm suggesting that we consider mating at three or four so that they don't start lactation and growing a fetus um, until they get out to this sort of zone. Um, and we maximise the production in at this zone. Um, I hear the, the geneticists saying, oh, but what about generation interval and so on like that? The younger you may breed them, the faster you get young, better goats and so on. Having said that, you can still do that with individual animals if you're prepared to pay uh, to feed them accordingly. Um, it's the question of payment for result. And uh, unless you put the food in, you don't get the mohair out. If you want to put heaps of food in, you can get high body mass early in their lives um, and get mohair production. But you've got to feed for it. So that's the key thing. So this is, this is a major fundamental difference between goats and sheep. Um, I think it's important that people realise this. Um, we keep applying sheep type reasoning to our farming of goats and it keeps failing us. We end up with goats that are small, stunted in growth and not even reaching their full potential mohair wise simply because we're breeding them too young. Um, the sexual dimorphism that I talked about earlier on is another thing. Um, if you've got an animal in here um, that's trying to produce both fleece and a kid or kids in a year, um, you, you are not giving it a chance to realise what its genetic potential is. Not only that, but the bucks, which are sexually bigger, they grow bigger because of their sex and the dimorphism that I mentioned, um, you end up, people end up, should I say, a lot of farmers, not just in New Zealand but overseas as well, have ended up using smaller males because they think they've got a superior fleece characteristic. Well, they don't necessarily. Um, what they've got is an inability to grow fleece and body weight at the same time. And so what the risk is that you use stunted males um, who are growing magnificent fleeces but they're not growing sufficient body mass. Um, goats, this is the other point which comes out of this graph, is that goats have a pre preferential uh, growth for mohair at the expense of body weight. Probably I should have mentioned that sooner. But if you don't feed them enough, they will keep growing the mohair. They will consume their own protein. They will fade away to nothing and kill themselves by growing mohair. They don't develop a break in the wool like a sheep does. They will actually consume their own body mass to grow the mohair. So, that's why I'm going to talk about these things, and I have started to talk about them. Um, flock dynamics, whoops, flock dynamics, um, I'm suggesting that maybe we look at shifting our flock dynamics, um, that maybe we should not be breeding does until they're three or four years old. By then they'll be big and they'll give you twins, you end up with as many twins, um, as many kids out of them over their lifetime anyway. Um, by removing animals sooner, you can make a huge difference to the flock dynamic and the economic dynamic um, by removing these animals sooner. So there's a spot in there where it's appropriate to breed from the does for the replacements that you need. Um, smaller numbers of females um, running larger numbers of weathers makes sense as well. If you're wanting to look at the sweet spot here, you've got to feed them. You've got to create a lot of weathers, a lot of young doe kids, and a lot of young animals, two tooths and even four tooths, six tooths even, um, before you breed from them out here. And then let them, let them grow out, grow them out here, put the buck out. Okay. Um, all those things are covered there. Right. Whoops. Yeah. We've got tools that we can have to help us get there. Okay. I'm sorry, but I'm going to carry on. Um, <laughs> you, you, you can take my minutes. 
<laughs> Thanks, Vicky. Uh, we've got lots of technology available to us today to help us get there. Um, Techion, for instance, they, they're involved in, in uh, worm um, detection in faecal samples. Um, it's dealing with pride. There's lots of other industries that have done similar sorts of things, change the way they operate uh, to move within the new, the new world that we live in, in terms of agriculture. And so using data and technology to help us get there is one of the little things that we can have. Um, talking about sustainability, today um, we talked about hemp, and that's part of what um, sustainability includes all these things, climate, the environment, our impact on the environment, and animal welfare. There's a lot more detail to be worked out, and Mohe New Zealand has putting, is putting together a sustainability program talking about exactly these things. So it's part of our vision for where Mohe goes into the future. Um, well, that's what might tomorrow bring. Um, it's a horrible sight, I know, but that's the view from the front of my uh, house, and that's the hen and chicks out there. Um, and this here is uh, Bismarck, who's been one of my mainstay bucks that I bought in uh, from, from overseas. Um, high producing animals, well fed, and um, looking the part. Um, okay, now a couple of things. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, Gene Ebeling said that you can't starve a profit out of an angle or a goat. Well, all I can say is don't even try. If, you, if you're running out of feed on your farm, cut some throats, cut your numbers, cut back on what you've got. Feed a few goats better is better than a lot of goats poorly. Um, and so things like that need to be thought about. Um, uh, Nikki Burston asked me specifically to mention the fact that I use cattle as part of my grazing regime. Um, obviously, we we'll always talk about worms when you talk about goats because much and all as I hate talking about worms, they're, they're a thing that restricts our ability to feed them well. Um, I think that you need to have a cattle component of your, of your operation. If you're going to farm them on any scale at all, it's essential. All the large producers that I know of, in the North Island at least, have at least a, a, a significant portion of their goats are farmed in conjunction with cattle. Um, I'm thinking Gary Boyle and Lynn Mill, myself, um, people like that. We all have large numbers of goats, our cattle with our goats. Um, okay, I'm getting the wind up signal, um, so I'll leave that with you um, and pass you over to John, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm learning, which is really good. John, am I allowed to ask you to give us an overview of where the market is for mohair? Just a few props here, guys. Oops. Never had one of these in my hand before, so I'm just going to have to, <laughs> to go with it. Just want to go back a little bit um, to, to go into the future, because what happened back when I first started um, is still the same today. Um, so a little bit of history. I, um, I was reading the Herald one day in 1978, it was, and uh, there was a goat, an angora goat from up north, eating thistles. And I thought, well, what a fantastic animal that's growing, a fibre that people want and it's cleaning up weeds at the same time. So that is still the same today. I mean, if you see the guys, um, David um, talked about da Gary Bull, Cimitel Cattle, where he puts his goats, there's no thistles. Where the, where the goats aren't grazing, there's, there's a lot of thistles. Um, so when it... Life's better with an angora goat. I'll just, just <laughs> take that up. Um, so when, when we first got into it, um, nobody was marketing the fibre. We were getting... Um, Agents um, from Bradford, no, no, uh, no reflection, but uh, uh, paying us about $3 a kilo. So the industry decided we had to get it together, and I had a shed 
and was um, um, growing mohair, it wasn't being sold. So we decided to, uh, to, to market it from our shed. And the one principle which I've stuck to all the way through was the market tells you what they want, not you telling the market. So in other words, every, all the buyers that came in, they told me what sort of lines they wanted, and that's the way I've, I've carried on marketing all, all the way through. So supplying what the, what the, what the market wants. Yeah, I don't know what this is going to do. Oh, that's not the one I want. I can go back, can't I? The properties. The properties of, of mohair that make it such an important fibre. The luster, that's its dyeing ability. So you get the, the brilliant colours that, that you see there. Durability, it, it's extremely strong and it's purportedly 30% stronger than wool as a fibre um, in strength, fibre strength. Uh, elasticity, again, um, you've, got, you've got garments. This is a mohair um, jacket I've got on. It seems to have shrunk a bit, but, um, uh, um, uh, but it, it, it's, got, it's got memory. So in other words, you, you hang your, your mohair garments up and they just they come back into shape. So this has been around about 20 years, and if I can wear something for 20 years, it's got to be a reasonably uh, strong product. Non-flammable, um, again, um, that's a really good property. You, you put a match to it, it doesn't burn. It just, uh, it just uh, goes. Moisture retention, as, as natural fibres have. Resistance to soiling, and mainly, mainly because it's a slippery fibre. So when you wash it, um, you, you have no problem actually getting rid of any, any, any dirt and stains and stuff. And it, it, it stays out. Tensile strength we talked about. Lightweight garments, lightweight blankets, like uh, one of the major users of, uh, or end users of, uh, of climate control. That's the... Um, Hot and cold, if you wear a mohair product, you, you, you generally stay reasonably warm in the winter or keep reasonably cool. David's still wearing his uh, sweater up there. And grease, crease resistant, which is, which is what I was talking about. When you put it in the, in the, uh, in the wardrobe, it just um, it hangs out. So they're the properties um, that we've got. World production. We'll go back here. World production. If we look at the world production, um, South Africa's the major producers of, of mohair in the world. Um, they've, they've got their problems. They've got um, predators, the game farms coming in. They've got the droughts, the, the recently droughts, so production's lower. And they've also got their political um, climate at the moment, which is seeing farms being taken over. So the production over there is, is actually slipping away. So total production, it's up there. It's about 2.8 million kilos worldwide now. Back in the day, uh, 80s, early 80s, it was about 24 million kilos. So it's dropped right back. Uh, the other main producing country is Turkey. Their mohair, their, their breeding programs, it's more lo like a crossbred mohair. So they've got, um, they put out good bucks, but they all go together and they just keep intermating and stuff. So they don't really make a great improvement to the quality. USA, back in the day, they had about 7 million kilos, but because the subsidies were taken off, they're now back down to um, a very small proportion of the of the total clip. Argentina the same as Turkey with their with their breeding programs. The quality of their mohair is not not up to today's um, quality. The Sotha they've, over the last um, ten years have increased rapidly. The South Africans have actually the Sotha is a little kingdom in the middle of South Africa if you don't know where it is. Um, and the the, the um, um, South Africans, particularly the mohair industry, has been quite. Um, helpful in that area to try and get production up because they want the volume. So that, that's where it's all produced. Uh, Australia and New Zealand, they've got us at 1% and Australia at 1%. Australia produce about double, but ours is about 25, 30 tonne and theirs is about 40, 50 tonne. If you get this so not, not a lot of mohair produced uh, in, in this neck of the woods. So that's the production. What do we got here? We don't really need that yet. So, um, so that's the world market. In New Zealand, the market, um, about 30% of the mohair is sold locally, um, and that's the blankets, um, the blankets, hand knitting yarns, and, uh, and are the main, the main uses for it. Um, recently, with, with COVID, um, when COVID came along, the, the uh, manufacturers actually halved their requirement or halved their orders. And two weeks after the lockdown came out, they doubled them because, the, because what's happened with, with hand knitting and with the rugs, that market has just 
flying away in New Zealand. So we're, so we're supplying quite a large proportion of the mohair to uh, the local, local production, mainly the fine adult for, for, the, um, for the blankets and uh, the kid, the sort of middle, middle range kid for the hand knitting yarns. So then if we look at um, the prices, again that's sort of micron rated, um, I just say this, Michael and Susie put this together, this son and daughter in law. They put the wool in just for your comparison for, the, for the, um, the types of wool. These are the current prices in New Zealand dollars at the last auction. They've risen over 30% since, since January. And uh, if you look at the different microns, our, um, our first year kid, 24 micron. I've got a point, haven't I? Look at that. Little toy. There we go. $79 a kilo. Now that's, that's a first year kid, and they're going to clip one and a half, the better ones with the modern genetics, one and a half kilos a year. So if you've got a doe producing two of those, that's quite, quite a lot of money. There's animals now with these prices producing over $250 of mohair a year. So then we go down the microns, we go down to uh, our young goat. We've got a sale coming up, I am just hope we can get somewhere close to these prices. So we, our, our young goat is a 28 to 9, that's the middle range, $57. And the goats are clipping between, per annum, 5 to 6 kilos, the better ones per annum of that. The, the fine adult, which is what the rugs are made out of, um, going to up to 36, 32 to 36 dollars. And there's animals out there clipping 8 to 10 kilos of mohair. This is the bucks that David, David showed you and stuff. So that's, and that's the sort of range, range they're in. We, uh, we don't have much of the, uh, the course anymore because obviously market signals um, it's better to produce finer. But we can't produce it all at the, at the top level because they're, they're not farmable. It doesn't, the fibre doesn't actually uh, survive. So the, this average range, 30, 31 micron for does, and you get the finer kids um, from, from that range. So, that's, so it's, it's, very, it's very profitable. Currently in the market, um, before COVID, China were very quiet. China have a habit of coming in and going out. Uh, they've come back into the market, and I suspect some of that is uh, looking after um, third world countries and, and sort of their um, aspirations. But they're back in the market, and it's actually putting pressure. Before they came to the market, the prices were strong, around about $20 for these, for these lines. And now, as you can see, they've gone up um, that 30%. Um, and China are taking quite a lot out, but the existing manufact manufacturers in Japan, Italy, um, mainly, um, um, still have to buy, buy their fibre. The chain is um, clogged at the moment because of COVID, the shutdowns and stuff, and the spinners are having trouble getting enough yarn out to, out to, out to the market. So that's really the market. Yeah. We can't get enough of it. Yeah. David, so uh, at good quality. Just, just interesting with the new genetics. Um, length is one of the things that's the, the price, price-wise. These um, the, the variation in animals at the moment and the, and the uh, amount of improvement that can be done in New Zealand. Um, if you look at the flock records, between 110 and 140 millimetres is the average flock. So if we've got it all up to 140 millimetres, six months um, grows a beautiful, beautiful long fibre. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of room for improvement in the country. Currently, the mowing that's coming through has got about three or four years of the new genetics, and we are seeing a major in increase in the quality and having no problem selling anything we can produce. Thank you. Thank you, John. And both mow here. This one's made out of kid, that one's made out of fine adult. Now the, the handle of this one's way better, but you can't sell them for any different price because it's, it's a mohair blanket, so that they'll, you know, if they like the colour of that one, they'll buy that rather than the nice soft handle and stuff. So just, mm. for, for the people at home, I'll, I'll just check if that's true. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> John, thank you so much. Um, interesting. So more profitable than sheep, and uh, uh, Dr. Vicky is going to help us uh, explain a little bit about the uh, nutrition and the husbandry of these animals. As already said, they're, they need a lot of food. <laughs> Vicky, up to you. Hi, um, I'm Vicky, and 
um, I wish I had a had David's um, talk before I actually presented my slides here because um, David had a brilliant slide that just basically covered pretty much a lot of things <laughs> that I wanted to say all in one slide. That was excellent. So I'm just going to kind of jump through this really quickly. This one, this just talks about me, which you don't really want to hear a lot about. You want to go on to the goats. But the one thing I just want to say that I've had a lot of experience, over 30 years of experience working with dairy, fiber, sorry, and meat goats, um, 26, the last 26 years in New Zealand. At present, I work for the Dairy Goat Cooperative. Um, and I just want to mention that because it's, it's an industry that's gone from being outdoors and producing about 35, 45 kgs of milk solids to moving indoors, um, feeding better, health is a lot better, eradicating or seeing, eliminating diseases, and um, now producing 110 or 120 kgs of milk solids per goat. So um, as David mentioned earlier, you got to, you got to, develop an environment for the goats that's going to get the best production out of them. And, and in this case, it's, it's not great having to move in, indoors and, and cut and carry, but the animals are so much healthier, bigger animals, um, uh, more producing more milk. So it's gone from a really, good, a really good industry, except for COVID's hitting right now, but still, they're really good producing animals at this point, and um, I think the industry is going to take, continue to take off. Um, as long as we can sell the, sell the, sell the milk powder. Um, I quite like David's picture as well of um, and kind of an ancestral, well, the ancestral goat for the mohair. But I was at a dairy goat conference um, show, and they have these goats, these Langeten goats in the Netherlands. Sorry. And um, I thought it was pretty amazing. I'm thinking, well, why is this goat here um, at a dairy goat um, show? And um, it produces a lot of milk. And, and um, it's an old, it's an, an old style um, goat, but it produces a lot of milk. And obviously you got meat and, and look at the fibers. And it's gonna be nothing like the mole here, but still, I thought that was quite great. I think goats are awesome, <laughs> as you might have guessed. We won't talk about dairy goats, but it's just looking at the genetics and things like that. And, and to get these really, uh, that, that British alpine in the corner, um, to get animals like that, you know, I mean, you get the genetics, you gotta just fade. I mean, you got to take care of them. Um, meat goats the same, but we're here to talk about the old fiber goats. So, as I mentioned already, does, you know, getting on top of your diseases, you know, healthy animals is going to be important to get that highly productive animal. Um, proper nutrition, we only have now probably 10 minutes to talk, but we're not going to really go much into that, but um, that's, that's very important as well. I mean, all these things combined to make that ultimate animal. The management, the environment are very important. And there's no sense of getting the genetics if you're not going to take care of the animals properly, feed them properly. And you just keep hearing us say, feed, 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 nutrition, nutrition. And it's so important. So energy, you know, a couple buzzwords and, and um, that most of you guys probably hear about and know about that just things you need to get your head around are things like metabolizable energy. And that's going to vary with, mainly with the size of the animal, how much they're going to need to eat, to grow, to either growing fiber, milk, producing milk, meat, um, fetuses, you know, that's it. You got to combine all that in and you got to feed that animal. And we'll just keep saying feed, feed, feed. Um, so we measure that in, in kilograms of dry matter. And that's going to be high, highly variable I have up there with regards to feeds. Um, and that's, uh, it seems like an obvious thing, but um, you really need to know how to grow your forages, whether the animals are in a cut and carry situation or a pasture feeding. And I have this picture down, that middle picture there. Um, that was in January this year on one of our goat farms. And it was just lush pat pasture when we're looking around at the other areas. I'm from the Hamilton White Kettle area, um, where we're having a bit of a drought. But this guy has the best pasture management, and that's what he was growing um, in, in January. And um, I mean, he has you know, highly producing animals that are producing about 130 kgs of milk solids. So it's all about that feeding and that quality of your feed. Um, forages first, these are ruminants. 
whether they're pasture being, being pasture fed or in this case, if they're going to be pasture fed or um, cut and carry, forages, they're ruminants. So you've got to feed, you've got to feed them good quality forages. And the concentrates are just kind of on top when the forages don't have enough of that metabolizable energy. You might need to throw in some concentrates, but that gets quite costly as well. But what's really important is that you feed your animals. And like David said, if you have to get rid of animals, so you have more feed available for them, you got to feed them, and you got to feed them good quality forages. Um, so we've talked about already, you, got, you have your maintenance, and then you have your growth. Um, and then obviously you have animals that are going to be pregnant, and they're going to be lactating, and they might be walking a lot. Sorry about that. Um, so all these things are going into how much energy do I need to feed these animals? And so you have, you have to look at your animals, and you have to see what you're feeding them. And you've got to make your adjustments. And when you make adjustments for how much you're going to be feeding them, it's going to be based on the largest animal. You're not going to base it on the average of, of the size of um, the animals that you're feeding. You go with the biggest animal in your herd, and you feed appropriately. So in this case, you can see that, um, as we mentioned already, mohair is going to take, excuse me, long button always. Um, so if you've got a 30 kg animal, and it's you know five grams of mohair every day, and you got one down here that's doing 15, and it doesn't seem like a lot. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot of difference, you know, looking at two, two MEs, but it is quite a lot. Um, if you got good quality forages, most of the average ones are going to be about nine, nine ME per kg of dry matter, and I don't know how much you guys know about how much these animals will actually eat. But for a 30 kg animal to eat um, a kg of dry matter, that, that's quite a lot. You know, when you're talking about a pasture that might be 12%, um, 20%, 30% at the very most of dry matter. So that's a lot of, um, that's a lot of um, uh, actual solids they have to take in. And then we take dry matter. So, if you're only eating 500 grams, 600 grams of dry matter, um, and you have, um, you're looking at an, an extra two, am I running out of time? <laughs> two, two ma. It, they got to take in a lot of, um, a, a lot of, a lot of grass. So what I'm basically I'm trying to say is you, every bite has to count. So you want to like a high me in the forages that they're eating or the concentrates that they're eating, so they don't have to eat that much to get that me that's required. I won't talk about that. This is not my area of expertise, but I just thought it's really interesting just to see. And David mentioned earlier about the angors um, down, 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 or the um, secondary fibers um, getting more. So I mean, if you can see the dairy goats, we're looking at mainly coarse hair, primary fibers. And when you go to the angora goats, we're looking at secondary fibers or down fibers being 100% of their fleece. Um, I didn't, wasn't too sure about the crowd I was going to be talking to, but um, quickly, <laughs> you got the primary fibers, like I mentioned before, it's those coarse hairs um, that you find. Um, and then you have the down fibers, um, or the secondary fibers, sorry, which we're looking at in Angora goats. And um, the difference between the seasonalities of when they growing in the cashmere versus the, um, the wool and the mohair that grow continuously throughout the year. And mentioning about the females have a bit more um, secondary fibers per square millimeter. Um, all these things kind of come into that wonderful graph that David showed with regards to knowing your animals, knowing how to feed them, knowing what you got. And if you have to make that adjustment, like instead of breeding them at six, seven months of age and waiting, as David was saying, to three, four years of age, um, because you have that increased amount of um, energy that's required for growing animals. And then we're talking about the males versus the females and all that. So you need to see the, the big picture to see what, you know, what kind of animals, how old animals, what you're going to be feeding them um, to get your best profit. Talking a little bit about the protein, as I thought was quite interesting when I was doing a bit of reading about the, um, how much protein you should be feeding these animals. 
And we're not talking about cashmere here, but it's interesting to see that you can feed the cashmere too much protein and affect their fiber growth. Um, but what's more interesting is looking at the angoras, and we have a tendency to actually underfeed, underfeed our goats. Um, and in particular, you can see that the angoras need 18% crude protein. So it's important to know what, once again, I keep saying, what, what, what animals we're feeding, and don't treat them like um, sheep. Um, in this case, you can't even treat them like cashmere's, and, um, and obviously don't treat them like cattle. The vitamins and mineral supplementation. So um, the importance of having good quality um, forages. Also, fertile soils are really important as well. So that's what the plant's eating, and then that's what the animal's eating. So we need, you, need to have, you need to know your soil analysis as well as your forages analysis as well. Um, so a couple of the important um, minerals with regards to fiber growth is going to be biotin and sulfur are really important. And um, uh, you get a lot of the sulfur in, a, in, a, in, the, um, in some of the soils, but some of them are de deficient in sulfur. And biotin, you normally have to add that to their diet somehow or to, their fo or to the soils. Vitamin A and phosphorus are going to be important for um, secondary, um, secondary fiber growth as well. And some of your vitamins are made in a rumen, and that will be some of the vitamin Bs and vitamin C. And so if you have an animal that um, um, is diseased or sick due to some type of GI infection, most likely parasitism, you're going to have a decrease in some of these vitamins that are going to be being developed in a rumen. So they shouldn't. First off, you need to get rid of the parasites <laughs> and, and whatever's causing that infection or that um, GI issue. And then also you have to supplement these animals. Make sure you're supplementing them with your vitamin Bs as well as your vitamin C. And, and other important amino acids we're going to look at is methionine and cysteine as well. You got your macro minerals and your uh, micro minerals. But this is one of the things I wanted, just wanted to talk about with regards to goats aren't sheep or they're not cattle. And um, like looking at one of these micro minerals, um, molybdenum, it's hard to say that one <laughs> for me. Um, you can see, once again, goats, goats are 10 times the requirement for, um, for this uh, mineral compared to sheep. And a lot of the times that we were getting mineral blocks in and, and they're either designed for cattle and sometimes they're designed for sheep. And the problem with things that are designed for mineral blocks that are designed for sheep um, is the copper component. It's always lower because the sheep are, are more susceptible to copper toxicity. So um, you, need, you need to have mineral blocks or loose minerals or um, liquid minerals that are designed for goats. Um, so you're getting the right amount of whether it is that um, the micro minerals or the, even the vitamins that are necessary for goats. Quick little chart there. Um, coppers is really important for everything. And I didn't put an X on weak kids. I don't know why because um, if the dough is actually deficient in copper, you will get weak kids as well. Two minutes? Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, it's just, you know, just knowing what minerals are important for the goats, getting at uh, minerals designed for goats. Um, this is my last slide. I didn't go into diseases because it's, I require a lot more than 15 minutes to talk about these things, but I put up the top ones that <coughs> need to get your head around, and that's a pretty sad looking little goat um, on the right side there. That one had, um, that is an actual an Angora goat, and it had um, yonis and body condition score at the moment of less than one. Um, and it was actually put down. Um, but that's an emerging disease. I wouldn't say emerging, it's been, it's been in the sheep industry, the deer industry, um, the goat and the dairy cows as, as well. And it's just, it's, get, it's getting, it's actually start, starting to get on top of us really. 
and even in some of our entities up in the, in the Waikato. So there's something you need to um, get your head around. And also, it's one of those diseases, yonis I'm talking about, that's linked to a human or zoonotic disease. They, can, they think it's a zoonotic disease. They're trying to make that linkage. And that's Crohn's disease in humans. So it's a wasting disease. And so it's, it's one of these things they're trying to dealing with, with um, some of our diseases and our antibiotic uses in our animals that are being linked to human diseases. Um, and it's a bit of a problem in our industry. But we've, um, we've eliminated CAE from our herds, our 70 herds in the Dairy Goat Cooperative. Um, and um, we're still dealing with a lot of foot diseases. Pneumonia in babies is an issue. Um, and then what I call cheesy gland or CLA, the lumps um, on the neck um, is a huge issue as well. And we've eliminated the parasitism problem because we've gone down from about 45, 50 hertz that were outdoors to one next season. <laughs> so we only have one that can manage it, and they manage it through cattle. They, you know, the cattle eat up the parasites, and it's eliminated there. And so they're the only ones, 350 goats outside. But so that's, that's really low on our list. And I believe that is it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Vicky. Um, <clears throat> Now it is time for you guys to get involved. Uh, questions uh, both here in the room as on uh, online. I hope you are using your chat function online and because that's the way um, you, your question can actually be asked to the speakers. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, we started off with uh, Dr. Pamjit talking about hemp and the hemp fiber and basically saying that it's, although it's a very old crop, we still have uh, um, a lot of research to do to, to come up with the solution, especially here in, in, in Canterbury when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to fiber production out of hemp. But it's a really promising crop um, with a growing global market. So that is always good to jump into a, a new fiber when the market is growing. I think that's what we learned from the uh, um, Angora uh, wool presentations as well. So uh, David and John were basically um, uh, alluding to that, that uh, there is a growing demand, uh, especially for high, quali high quality fibers. And um, of course, when you talk about uh, uh, yields of between 150 and $300 per animal, I think we all getting a little bit excited, at least I am. Um, then uh, Vicky uh, alluded us that uh, uh, goats are a very specific species and they need a specific way uh, of husbandry uh, um, uh, veterinary care and rotation. Um, so with that quick summary, I'd like to thank the speakers and open the floor for questions. I think the first question is online. Julia. Cool. I've got a question here from uh, Emily. Uh, this is for Palm Jute. There are currently developments underway to install a hemp fibre processing facility in Christchurch <coughs> with the aim to create a range of products using, uh, using strong wool and hemp blends. Do you see this as a positive alliance between these two industries? And what do you think hemp can bring to the strong wool industry or vice versa? Sorry, can you repeat again a little bit? <laughs> from Emily. I have a question for Palmjeet. There are currently developments underway to install a hemp fibre processing facility in Christchurch with the aim to create a range of products using strong wool and hemp blends. Do you see this as a positive alliance between these two industries? And what do you think hemp can bring to the strong wool industry or vice versa? Thanks, Emily. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's a positive development. Like, currently, the gap is how you separate this bask fibre from the herd. That's where the big thing is in a way to do it in a more uh, economical way. But uh, after that, the as I shown in my last slide, there are few challenges. But the good thing is, whatever we are using for the cotton, uh, those spindles, uh, once that fiber is there, it can be uh, directly done on that. 
and uh, it's a degumming process which is needed for this niche textile production. So simply it can be done. So that's a, that's a quite good thing. The gap is there when you are separating by decortification uh, because different cultivars will have different tensile strength and different textile things. So that's where the more uh, gap has to be, unmet need is there. Thank you very much. I have a question here in the room. Okay. Goat question. Um, uh, around pasture composition. So the traditional view of goat is they actually need quite woody vegetation. Clearly the demand for um, the fibre production here means they need a really high protein intake, which means very lush pasture and with very high clover levels. So what are you doing around pasture management and what species are you putting in pasture to get that protein level up? Charles, thank you very much. Yeah. You still have your microphone, uh, David, so yeah, you can stand here, that people can see thank you, you. That's it's good. Um, good question. Um, typically, where angoras are farmed successfully internationally, uh, the, the feed composition is, is made up of forbs and herbs, and, and, um, as, well as, as well as some grass species. Um, and so there are high levels of nutrition per kilogram of dry matter um, in those species. In New Zealand, um, we're going to see at Nikki Burston's on the, on the field day at her place uh, where she's used a pasture mix. Uh, personally, I'm using uh, uh, three systems. Uh, I'm using a, a long rotation to create pasture length. Um, the reason for that is that seed heads and, and the like are high in nutrition, but also it, it, um, it lowers the parasitism uh, because of the um, height above ground level that parasites will climb up the, the growing tip. Um, so I use the longer fibre uh, um, pasture to be grazed by the goats, tip grazed, and then bring the cattle through um, as my hoover to get rid of the parasites and so on. Um, the other thing is pasture species that you alluded to, your question, um, using chicory, plantain, and typically um, that type of thing. Uh, up north, we don't have much success with, with lucerne. Uh, it does. It gets too weedy up there and too too many bugs, but but lucerne is an ideal um, ideal pasture for or you know for a fodder species for goats. Yeah. Thank you so much. We have a question in the back microphone. Yeah, and, and another question as well. Okay. Um, my question is actually for all three. I'm interested in how markets develop in these emerging spaces, so it's, it's for ev uh, all of the panellists. Um, if there was one thing you could do, kind of a magic wand, to get to a point, we, we know that there's potential in all of these markets, what's the one thing you would do to get to a point where lots of New Zealand farmers are farming these, these products and making a good amount of money, a, a real successful market for New Zealand, what would you do for your industry if you could do one thing? Hemp. Angora, goat, so, so on. I, th I think what I'll do is I'll ask John to uh, comment on the uh, on the mohair side, and I'll ask Dr. Pemji to uh, comment on the hemp side. So th thank you. Um, one one of the um, slides I put up there was the um, production, the prices. Uh, we can't achieve those prices because we haven't got the volume. The, those are South African prices. They've got a brand, a Cape brand. And, and when our mohair goes over there, specific clients only want Cape mohair, and it's, it's supposed to be an, um, an, an industry with integrity. Um, so we can't get that premium, um, it's probably about 10%, um, estimated at 10%, that we put up there because we haven't got the volume. Some of those lines, the top lines that we sell, the, the fleece like that there, we would only get two or 300 kilos a pull, two pulls a year. And so the super fine only comes in the one in the one shear the, the, the kids. So volume is one, um, and when you've got volume, then you can get uh, your branding. So it's it's a New Zealand brand. Um, we've got a very good reputation for producing fibres worldwide, but we haven't got the volume. So these guys are requiring lines of four to ten tons when we're providing fifty to a thousand um, kilos. At each time, so so volume for me. David disagrees a little bit, but uh, but that's something that um, we need more volume. Thank you so very much, Dr. Panjita. 
So in our case, like this is an important thing is this crop has those male and female plants looking so different if you have seen. So consistency of the crop is not there. And currently this new technology for decortification is quite new. They, to removing the fiber from same kind of consistent cultivar is important. If I can do, I can give a cultivar which can be consistently giving the same fiber. So that decortification can be easily done until more uh, plants are tried on that in terms of uh, different fiber characteristics. So that's what I can do on my expert side. Thank you so much, Katie. We have a question over there. Surinder Tandon from Tandon Textile Innovations. My question is for John or David. Uh, uh, we know that the uh, crossbred wool industry has been struggling. The you know the wool price there is uh, hardly two fifty three dollar kilo, and we see this uh, from today's presentations from. John, that the mid-micron mohair, you know, fiber, uh, we can sell for about $40, $45 a kilo. So I want to ask a question, are there any attempts to increase the number of, uh, you know, mohair goat or angora goat uh, where on the farms where they have been, uh, you know, breeding or, uh, you know, having uh, uh, Romney type sheep or other type of cro crossbred sheep. You know, we earlier saw that a lot of sheep, coarse crossbred sheep farmers had converted to dairy farms. How about converting some of these to, you know, these uh, mohair and angora uh, goat farms? Thank you. I've got, a, I've got a standard line for this one. Um, <laughs> We've just done, I'm not sure what the cost was. What was the, wool, what did the wool report cost? It, millions, wasn't it? It was millions. And what did it come back? And all the farmers, while they still think it's a good product, it's not a good product if the market doesn't want it. So for wool, 25 micron, you're up to $10 a kilo. 34 microns, you're down to dollar, I think dollar eighty. I was talking to somebody the other day. Um, so it's a frustration of, of ours over the, over the last, 20 odd years not being able to get um, farms to realise it. I mean, the answer for wool is use your, use your DNA, crossbreed, get all your good traits and then, and then breed into, into finer. But right now the Angora goat is, um, is, is a good answer. I mean, we do find when people go into um, Angora goat farming, the first year they're not a very good animal to move from one place to another. After one year, they, they almost lose their immune system in that first year as, they, as they're moving. So if you can get a farmer to farm them through for one year and, and their immune system comes back into, into kilter again, then they're good farming. But that, that first year can be quite fraught with, uh, with foot scold and things like that. But, but the second year out, um, they seem to come right. So there is that transition phase which, which farmers... Uh, it frustrates me, at the end of the day, to hear people calling wool at 32 to 38 micron, a good product. A good product is something the market wants and people want mohair. here. Yeah. Oh, hello. I'd just like to comment on that. Um, coming from a sheep and beef farming background, and I think what happened was during the boom years, a lot of farmers got goats and they didn't look after them. They had foot problems. The goats weren't as good as they are today. And there's quite a stigma in the sheep and, farm, um, sheep and cattle farmers against goats and I think it's about putting out, educating them on the systems, you know, what you need to do to farm goats properly and just, yeah, I don't know what the answer is but I think there needs to be more education specifically at farmers to give it a go and give them a lot of support through, like John said about that first year might be difficult in that, but getting the word out, you know, to try them and they are different goats nowadays than they were back in the 80s and because they have been cold and you've got better feet, you know, and things like that. Thank you very much. That was, uh, and, and there are a couple of more questions. And I think what I like to say is like what Dr. Vicky already said, that if we look at Angora goats, uh, they're probably not for every sheep farmer because I know that a lot of sheep farmers are using marginal land, and of course the Angora goat will probably not thrive on, mar on, on marginal land. So I fully agree with you that there, that there needs to be a mix of uh, 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 different species and different systems here in, here in New Zealand. 
more questions. Oh, could I just sort of add a comment to that? Thank you for that comment from the sheep and beef farmer over there. As um, a member of Mohair Canterbury, we are trying to support and educate um, sheep and beef um, farmers and bring them into the industry. And we do have a number of sort of networks and websites to do that. So you can check out mohairproducers.co.nz or mohaircanterbury.co.nz. Both of those will give you lots of information on how to farm goats and also contacts and support networks to help you um, become introduced into the um, Angora goat sort of fraternity. Thank you. Thank you. Lady up here, a question, Katie? You'll get a microphone. Hi, I'm Sarah Gerard. Um, I'm a landscape architect and I'm just um, remembering the um, goats from the past and um, just wondering how the new breeding of goats, how um, that the effects on the environment because in the old days, the goats jumped fences and got into conservation areas, and uh, and also um, how they compare um, methane levels and that sort of things. Just so, just a, a sort of general idea between the environmental impacts I'm versus. I'm going to see picking. if Dr. Vicky has an answer to that. <laughs> that's a, that's a quite loaded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Um, well, where should I start with your question? Um, um, so what was kind of the first one? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they used to jump fences regularly. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so I'll start with that one. Yeah. And so the, the farming of, of goats, the actual farming of goats, mm -hmm. um, has gotten better with regards to their fencing and keeping animals in. And so then there's not a lot of jumping out. I mean, you got the feral, you got the feral goats, you will see, that will jump into paddocks and things like that. But those are pretty much those feral goats out there. But um, the ones that are refarming at, at the moment, they got good fencing. So. Um, Yes, there is an impact of the environment from the goats that have escaped <laughs> and, are out, and are out there, and they're quite hardy goats in the way, but there are actually a lot of farming, and I shouldn't say farming, there's a lot of mustering and getting rid of um, feral goats all the time. So um, as for our domesticated ones or the ones that are being farmed, I think you're pretty safe with regards to them jumping out and, in a way, destroying the environment. Um, that was one. You had another question? Yeah, Sorry. about the methane yeah. production. Is there any research about oh, methane production? Oh, there's heaps of going on. Sorry, excuse me. There's heaps of going on right now with regards to how much is being produced out of the goats. So um, I don't have a number for you. Um, they are smaller animals, so they are producing less than cattle um, just because of their sheer size. Um, we're working on, in our particular industry at, at the moment, we're working on different feeds we can feed them to decrease the amount of methane that's being released. And um, so we're work, the future is working on decreasing the amount of, not even the amount of animals and making them more efficient so we have less animals, as well as looking at possible feeds we can feed them to, do, to decrease the amount of methane that's being released. Is there another one? Thank you, thank you so much. I have a question online, uh, Julie, or not? No, I don't have a question online. We just online. have time for just one more. I appreciate there's a couple of people in the audience who want to continue to comment, which is, is great, and we would like you to continue those conversations at the end, but we just have time for only one more question. So if we could take that, and then happy for everyone to disperse, network, and, and take those questions offline. I have a question up front here. Can you also comment on the impact of the size of a urine patch of a goat and a sheep versus a dairy animal? Because in terms of nitrogen leaching, my understanding is that's quite critical. Yeah. The same thing, the smaller animal, um, the less of an impact <laughs> um, because less urine, isn't it, really? Um, and, and that's why so it's important. But yes, we have more animals per hectare. No doubt, no doubt about that. Shall I comment back? Yeah, I can. <laughs> yes. Yeah. My understanding is basically because you have smaller animals, the urine patch is a lot smaller, um, and there's a lot more of them, so the urine is distributed much more evenly across the pasture, whereas a dairy cow, 
pisses an awful lot of urine in one very small area. Yes. And you get a very significant overload of the soil system, and that's where you're getting the nitrogen leaching. So to me, it's one of the reasons for moving from a, a dairy milk, a cow milking system, to a sheep milking system. Your nitrogen leaching can decrease dramatically just because of the change in the animals. Oh, definitely. So, I mean, what you, you pointed it out, <laughs> and, and you're absolutely correct. Um, don't try, I try not to um, bash other um, industries, but um, you're absolutely right. I mean, there is this less, less, less urine and more distributed, so um, you're correct about that. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you for the audience. Um, we are getting to the end of our this innovation series. But not before I'm going to allude you to some other great events that we are going to organize. Because remember, we love to connect with you and we love, uh, we love to start collaborating. Uh, next week, we have the Food Fiber and Agritech Challenge in uh, uh, Christchurch. Um, there is a lot, there is a challenge going was going on over the last couple of months where innovators uh, uh, around the country in the food fiber and agri-tech sector were actually going to uh, uh, develop their ideas to market and the top 10 finalists are actually pitching. It's a free event so uh, all are very welcome. Um, on the 18th of May we're going to look at uh, alternatives uh, for uh, energies uh, on farm. Uh, on the 19th of May, we'll have a Vibe series, which is a little bit, a little bit smaller, smaller than this, uh, where it's networking is the most important thing, and we're going to talk about uh, the Earth uh, uh, Precinct, which is a collaboration where we're actually going to talk about the environment, agriculture, research, um, teaching, and health. Uh, sorry, not teaching, technology and health, and uh, that that con. That consortium is actually uh, led by, uh, by, by Will, and he will actually talk about that, how there is synergies possible there. And on the 10th of Ju June, we'll have our Activator series again. So did we do that in, in conjunction with the Canterbury uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, and they are actually helping uh, people to accelerate their business ideas. If you think this is a cool place and you want to work with us for a day, your first day is free. And if you like it so much, you're of course allowed to rent a desk or a space. Um, thank you so much for, for, for being here. Thank you so much uh, um, uh, for your participation. Um, feel free to have a, a discussion afterwards and uh, the people online as well. Uh, thank you so much for your questions in the chat and the recording will be uh, available uh, in about 72 hours. Thank you so much. <laughs>